then the new concepts of what this new anatomy understanding leads of clinical, leads to clinical. But at the same time, then it became a market niche. And there was so much uh, enthusiasm on uh, some to try to find a way of making things easy, quick, and, and, and reproducible. And that ended in inappropriate results. And by the time he was uh, interested in rhinoplasty, he was making close rhinoplasty, so I started my career yeah. with the close rhinoplasty, and, and, and minute by minute, I got in love with this field, and uh, eventually I expanded to the face state and all the other procedures, so the most surgery, but of course, mm -hmm. yeah, because I wanted to understand a little bit more of the physiology, because there was no science mm -hmm. and no surgical treatments, so I published almost 40 papers for these companies, you know, to get a little bit more of science behind that. Mm -hmm. And from that time, I moved to the second specialty, which was the ENT, mm -hmm. and uh, I became consultant, and then an associate professor, and then poor professor. And then this is uh, my life at the University of Verona, where I perform uh, like congenital abnormalities, um, right? And then uh, moving around the world, I train people different uh, fields and this is it my story is uh, a long story but ah, a very it's, it's very, a very 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 nice story because i live for this job every minute i have an idea i want to write a book i want to yeah, write yeah. a paper as all of us yes uh, it's our uh, yesterday was asking awesome for the what are your hobbies and yeah. he said to me Rhinoplasty, I think Rhinoplasty, yeah. I live for this. Yeah, that, this is our hobby. Yeah, sure. Every rhinoplasty is a preservation, rhinoplasty, unless you are a clumsy surgeon. You know, you try to preserve the mucosa, you try to preserve the valve areas, you try to preserve the cartilage as much as you can, the soft tissue, otherwise you're not a good surgeon. Mm. But the term preservation, if you're not doing preservation, you're doing a destructive rhinoplasty. No, it's not true. <laughs> ah, yeah, okay. yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, it's not true. Yeah, because it almost, uh, it's to say like, my way is the only way. Yeah. But it's not necessary. And people are still getting excellent results without any preservation. Yeah. Well, what, what, what does a preservation preserve? Preserves the junction of the upper laterals with the dorsal papillary receptor at the keystone here. Other than that, it is destroying everything else. Sure. Right. So first of all, the idea came from looking at scoliosis patients. Mm. I was with a very good physio who was looking at a scoliosis patient. And I heard him say that we want to weaken one side and strengthen the other side because the muscles go weak on one side and they're strong on the other side. And unless you work on that, no matter what you do with scoliosis, even postoperatively, they will they can bend back, and that's why they use these rods to fix everything. Yes, you know. So I thought, well, that tells me something. Yes. So I immediately thought that must be the case in deviated noses or what you call the scoliotic noses. Mm -hmm. So, and then I thought, okay, let me try this then. So next time when I did a severely deviated nose, I used plenty of Botox, close to 100 units on all the muscles around the nose. And I thought three, six months later, that nose stayed where it was. So that's how it worked. So then I, you know, I'm convinced as surgeons and, you know, we could speak to, we've been at meetings, we all talk about what graphs we put, how we stabilize, what we do. We don't talk about the muscles. I want to hear that funny story again. You told me about the cardiothoracic surgeon. Ah, tell our listeners about <laughs> yes. that. This was, uh, it was interesting. Uh, I operated uh, a few years before uh, and my colleague and cardiothoracic surgeon, very experienced. He was always working with blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He saw open the thorax and it's yeah, yeah. up inside and etc. And uh, uh, his wife needed an, uh, an uh, rhinoplasty. So yeah. I did the rhinoplasty and he asked me to be present in the OR. I said, it's, you know, the basic principles are against that. Yes. Because there are principles that say, don't be in the OR, don't operate people that you like, and don't be in the OR people that you have a strong emotional relationship. Yes. And he said, no, I will be there because she meet me. And, uh, and then I said, you have to ask the director of the private 
a hospital and he gives him uh, he said also okay you can go and then he came inside i started with my rhinoplasty and then he collapsed <laughs> Yes. Where I do believe that the outcomes also depends on the person carrying out the test, because yes. depending on how you position the probe, yes. you will have better or worse outcomes of your measurement. Yes. I tend to believe more in the peak nasal respiratory flow measurement because yes. the outcomes of this, this technique reflects more the subjective feeling yes. of nasal obstruction. Nowadays, I tend to rely even most on the mirror test, which yes. is very simple, yeah. which I always use to convince and, and show patients how badly or how well their nasal breathing is. And for me, this is also a tool to convince them that the breathing is not as bad as they think. Yeah. So I often use it to eliminate those who come to see me for facial functional problems, yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to get an aesthetic re uh, rhinoplasty reimbursed. Uh, I was astonished. I immediately thought I need to throw myself into this. Uh, and we all like the challenge being involved in this field. Uh, there's no doubt. Um, and I, you know, I'll tell you something that maybe sounds provocative, but I don't think it really is. Learning preservation rhinoplasty will make you a better structural rhinoplasty surgeon. Mm. The simple example I can give is that let's say you have a room and you enter in in this room via you know the door and you exit via another door yes and you do this every single day yes but all of a sudden you open a different door to that room and you exit through a different door it's going to change your perspective of that same area okay. so the nose is a small part of our anatomy yes and you all of a sudden see it from a different perspective. Yes. The anatomy of the nose in our region is very similar. All of the Middle Eastern noses, we have similar problems. Most of us, we have thick skin, uh, hump and droopy teeth. And these are the typical uh, nose of the Middle Eastern and Persian nose. And you know, uh, your noses in the South Africa is totally different uh, uh, from our country. And you know, the noses of here in the Europe is totally different from our country. And you know, we must have our own techniques. Some of the techniques that work uh, for the European patients doesn't work for us, for me and you. And it's a mistake uh, from some of my patients and your patients for sure also. Yeah. They bring the picture and the portrait of some of the, uh, for example, mm -hmm. actress from the Europe countries and they like, uh, they want to be the same nose. It's impossible because yeah, the anatomy of the nose is totally different. This is not an easy technique, not at all. You need a lot of experience. It said it is fast. It is really not fast. It is not faster than the other one. Then it said you can apply almost in each and every nose. This is nonsense. Yeah. And the fourth thing is um, that it is said there are almost no complications. Ask, not myself, ask some other people like um, Nassim Circus or Enrico Roboti, who are the guys who are dealing a lot with revision. They have many patients who had a preservation rhinoplasty. They need now rib grafts. And that was originally the idea also from Roland Daniel that we can avoid all these things. This is not true. Yeah. And we have to come back to a realistic perspective on that problem. So for beginners, yes, straight dorsum patients, and not white, not narrow dorsums. Yeah. It should worse to preserve. Yeah. I mean, you have to look at the nose and you don't want to destroy anything. So you want to keep it intact. So yes. they are the good candidates okay. and not kyphotic dorsums. Yes. Not S-shaped bony humps. Yes. Because you need to work on the surface, then you cannot manage as a yes. big beginner yes. some, some, sometimes perfectly. So okay. it's better to start with the simple cases simple hump not the kyphotic one yes and you have to of course follow the rules of blocking points you have to release all the tension yes. then you can get easily the result at the end 
I arrived to Turkey, to Istanbul. Yeah, yeah. And I saw what, uh, who I consider my mentor is Baris Checker. Yes. So I saw him the first time and uh, I said, okay, I want to follow. Yeah, this. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to follow him. And uh, I came back to Italy and uh, I didn't have any patience, you know. Who wants to go and have a surgery yes. with you that yeah. you just finish the residency? Yeah. So I said to my friends, I said, okay, look, I do your surgery for free, but no, it's my first nose, but you don't have to pay anything. You just have to pay the clinic. Okay. And they were, they, they trust me. Yeah, yeah. So I put all my energy to make a good nose and I saw, I saw that there was not too bad. Yeah. And then I, I operate many friends okay. and then I start to feel more comfortable. You know, when I do a breast surgery, my brain is not working much. My hands are working more. Okay. And I similarly face this, but yeah. in rhinoplasty, in every step, you have to think and yeah. you have to be fully concentrated on the surgery, yeah. not to make mistake, because it's a surgery that the, you make a maneuver, you make a motion that interplays the other places, yeah. other things. And, you know, you have to think about the next steps. So, so a, a topic I've been discussing with a lot of the people on the podcast lately is, is like the mental aspect of rhinoplasty. Um, and the few things that I'm interested to know is how do you look after your own mental well-being as to, for you to be, remain as healthy and happy and focused when at times you have difficult patients to treat but it's also quite a busy job i mean you've got yes. residents you've got to teach you traveling the world that kind of stuff oh that's a very important question after the this covid pandemic uh, i changed everything yeah uh, i'm planning i'm almost doing this i take off on fridays i do not work on fridays Beautiful. so i get to serve friday saturday and Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a we have an, in, in Afrikaans we speak in South Africa we say Friday is my day, Friday is my day. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's a good concept. Clinical research uh, took me all over uh, the world, but I always came back to Heidelberg, and I'm working currently in Mannheim. So what I focus on uh, is my field of uh, study is facial perceptiveness, is mental disorders in rhinoplasty and. Uh, quality of life, how the things we do affect the patient. So not much as a surgeon uh, perspective, but more on the patient's perspective. So I'm, uh, I'm uh, using a lot of patient reported outcome measures. We're validating them. We're getting new ones just to make sure that our patients are um, getting um, hopefully the best treatment uh, they can have. So we're evaluating all the time and see what we can do better. Well, it's, it's exciting. Uh which is good and bad um you know you get uh you get the best of the best but you also get the worst of the worst because you're you're not only in the spotlight but you're also in the target site yeah. you know it's yeah. like walking around with a bullseye on your back a little yeah. bit yeah. too so yeah. you have to kind of roll with the punches you have to realize that the higher you climb up the pole the cleaner shot they have at your ass so you yeah. want to, uh, I love this. <laughs> it's so true, right? Yeah. yeah. Cause yeah, it's yeah. like, okay, well you want to be out there. Well, guess what? Yeah. You know, yeah. people are going to take shots at you. You know, the, the trolls are real. Uh, you just have to kind of understand that with the territory of being in that environment, which is intense, mm. you know, patients come to Beverly Hills cause they want the ultimate plastic surgery experience. Yes, yes. They want it to be the plastic surgical dream yeah. that they had of, you know, perfect rhinoplasty. No matter what nose they come in with, if they get a facelift, they want to be, you know, yeah. turning back the clock 20 years. They yeah, they yeah. don't want average results. That's not exactly. why you go to Beverly exactly. Hills. It's crazy. And you, are you, you facial plastic surgery. Are you are you ENT trained or plastic surgery trained? Uh, ENT trained. Okay. So in, in my day, it was a little bit different. And so much has changed in contemporary surgical training in the United States. But uh, my training started in the aftermath of the pyramid system. Pyramid system was, as it sounds, kind of a knockout elimination process where yeah. you took 20 people and you ended up with a, a, a far smaller number. That had ended by the time I went through my training, but general surgical training 
in the United States was still a very important part of all surgical training. So you did two years of general surgical training, yeah. uh, of which is very morbid, a lot of critical care, a, a lot of uh, intensive care work, a lot of trauma work. Uh, and then you do four years of Odo, and yeah. then thereafter, another year of facial plastic surgery. Dean's great. I mean, Dean will look like he's 29, I think, for another 20 years. Uh, <laughs> you know, and honestly, I've seen him. I've sat at him at dinners, uh, and he eats so clean. He doesn't even order soda. I mean, it's yeah. it's tremendous. I'm, I'm getting better at that. Yeah. Uh, I limited, you know, things that... Uh, I, I think about my gut health, my mental health. Um, I weight train, I work out. I'm better some weeks than others. We're all, you know, have t rough weeks yeah, where yeah, we just yeah. can't even make it to the gym. We can't do one jog. Yeah. But I try to at least do some form of meditation here and there. Yeah. Take time, go for a walk, get out in nature. Yeah. I mean, that's what makes us human. You can yeah. really get lost, especially in Beverly Hills. I've seen it happen in competitive markets. Great, yeah. People get lost into their business and what ends up happening, you end up becoming almost um, a slave to your own business. For years, I stayed away from the idea of writing a textbook. Yeah. Uh, and around 20 years in practice, which is a couple of years ago, I finally started warming up to the idea. Yeah. Uh, because I thought, well, it'd be nice to sort of consolidate some of the, my philosophies after two decades of rhinoplasty. Yeah. Listen, we're all students. I'm still learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and also because I think there was a gap in the, at least in the textbooks, uh, regarding fusing structural and preservation concepts. Yes. Uh, and so I wanted to have a comprehensive book, which yeah. wasn't three huge volumes or something that someone could get through. Yeah. yeah. That goes through the basics, uh, structural rhinoplasty, how to approach patients, yeah. all the way through preservation and then revision and complex case concepts. Yeah. And... Um, now our kids are gone. We are just by ourselves. What I do is I work in the garden. Yes. Uh, I like gardening. I yes. love gardening. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we spend. A, I spend a lot of time in the garden uh, yeah. throughout the year. Istanbul has a nice climate, so yeah. you can imagine every season you have something else to do in the uh, garden. I was there last year in about Which April, one? May. April, May. And the flowers, the time. tulips, I, I just, think. It was astounding. Just, eh? Yeah, it's sometimes in some seasons, you know, April, May and uh, June. Yeah. I think fascinating yeah. uh, because uh, the city is full of uh, smells of the yeah. some of the trees, some of yeah. the flowers. Uh, it's a good time. Yeah. It's a good time. And uh, I enjoy being there. Yeah. I always loved Istanbul. I always wanted to live there. I started in June of 2019. And since we met last, I basically completely changed the way I managed the upper two thirds of the nose, both wow. from reduction of the dorsal hump yeah. as well as to augmentation yeah. of the, uh, the dorsum. Because right now, I'm using intermediate level strips in most situations as well as low strip and deviated mm -hmm. septums. I'm using a, a letdown type of technique. And then I'm using a push up with rib cartilage for uh, ethnic patients, black, yes. Asian yes. patients. Yes. And I'm loving it. I'm actually, I'm, I'm really loving it. Yeah, because about uh, just over a year ago, I came and spent a week with you, and it was so formative being able to just be with you in the OR and see. The biggest takeaway for me was how you've been able to, like the preservation tools can be used in what was previously maybe considered, no, that's an open structural rhinoplasty. It's been a knowledge of 100 years. The septum in Caucasians is two to seven millimeter thickness changing in different uh, regions. Mm -hmm. So if you make them thicker, it's not the end of the war. People are forgetting one thing, mucosa. Mucosa is the organ of the nose. It is not the other thing, honestly. Mm. So when you make it thin, the mucosa becomes much thicker. Mm -hmm. When you have thicker cartilage, the mucosa becomes narrower. A lot of people That's forget eh? the, the nasal passages shouldn't be too wide. They shouldn't be too narrow either. Yeah. So if you make it too wide, the tendency becomes the turbulence compensated to make it narrower because the nose is trying to find its ideal passage mm. by keeping nasal cycle and all those reflexes in place. And so if I make this, the septum thicker, the mucosa becomes thinner. 
and then the second point I would say is just that how valuable this is because it's an objective tool for research and following the outcomes of patients. Yes. And, you know, we've done several studies looking at edema, how, how quickly does edema and what type of modifications to edema, you know, can we see with time in different graph types. For instance, you know, we looked at septal extension graph versus Collie-Meller strut and followed this for 18 months and showed differences from one subgroup to another. You can look at different gender differences, ethnic differences, et cetera. So, yeah, yeah. You know, it's not just the morph and it's not certainly not promising a um, result, but it's communication, it's uh, screening patients, and it's performing research yeah. that I think are. I think it's uh, loving what you do. It's your passion that drives you, and it's the ability to be persuasive, to be pa uh, not only passionate, but also to um, make a difference. And I think those are all things that. You know, you have to be purpose-driven in life. Yeah. If you don't have a purpose-driven life, you're nowhere. I yeah. Mean, you have to be so focused on doing what you love to do. And I think that's what makes makes it tick. And if you stop being purpose-driven, you die. So you've got to keep going. I think it's very important. And that's passion so is what it's all about. You know, if you want, you got to be passionate to be great at what you do. Because there's a lot of stumbling blocks, you know, success isn't like this, it's like this. You know. He said, do it. I said, thank you. I, I did it, it worked. You know, the, uh, this is very important. Yeah, yeah, but remember, you, you <laughs> did that after you'd already been operating thousands and thousands no, of times. No, it's not true. It's not true. It's, it's always the same thing. Yeah. Believe me. You know, you, if, if you operate thousands of thousands, you're going you're gonna to get better in your mistakes. You know... I love that. Yes. So if you're at operate thousands of you're going to get Thousand. better with your mistakes. Mistakes. You're going to be the best in your mistakes. Um, as I developed it, that's when, uh, you know, COVID hit and suddenly there's been this huge uh, growth in the, uh, in rhinoplasty and facial plastic surgery. And I started uh, following some of the new preservation concepts and, uh, you know, led me to uh, Dr. Shakir, and I uh, wanted to come see him, and also Mike Nyack, who has really developed uh, the the new advances and innovations in the deep neck. So I'm here to uh, see them, to do a cadaver dissection, learn from them, and uh, and uh, it, I suppose Istanbul is becoming the uh, the world capital right now for rhinoplasty. So uh, particularly for endonasal preservation concepts. So that's that's my goal. Yeah. But plastic surgery was has always been a, a, a passion in my life. It's I'm a, I play drums, so I like music, I like art. So at the end, uh, in medicine, I sort of saw, saw that as the specialty that would most characterize my way of being and thing that I would enjoy doing. And I think I chose well because I can tell you, I feel that I'm you know, not working every day. I'm just, I'm just having fun. This is a really fun career, and you know that, because I can see you, the passion that you put into your videos you're not working. You're you're just having fun. <laughs> and you know it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Obviously, yeah. you know, we have our days. But anyways, I think it, you know you can have the best job in the world and you'll have your days. But at the end, most of it, it's fun. This was a surprise for me because when I go, come to the to the uh, residency hospital, yes. it was a very busy hospital. Was it still in Izmir or no, Istanbul. Istanbul. Okay. I, I, I switched yeah. to Istanbul. Then, at the same night shift. At, at, the, at the first night shift of my, my uh, residency, yeah. I met with Suraya. No. Yes, this was my, my turning point of my uh, fate or something, yes. uh, you see. Yes. Then uh, he told me I'm also night shift. I'm, uh, I was in the night shift and we talked all night. And then uh, he, he saw that I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in this kind of like sculpturing yeah. and doing something, uh, you know, from something to something, like evolving yeah. something. So. So then uh, he started to take me to his operation, but he was also uh, learning because the, the year was like 2000. Um, our job is uh, we are doing, we are working with people. So you have to give time, sometimes extra time to your patients, not just about the surgeries, before and after the surgeries. Our, our job is about the trust. Yes. And so we have to establish a good relationship with the patients future patients and some of them doesn't come, you know, just give time. Uh, this works like that. And my patients are mostly all over the world. And so 
they have to trust you more, you know, they don't see you in person. You do video calls, you give time, but still they want to see you're a real person, you have a family, you have a child, and you, have, you are based in a, in a city and working properly. Many common problems that we have with uh, other surgeries, uh, other surgeons, and why should we try to invent something if they did it first? You know, the knee surgeons, they, they know lots and lots about cartilage. So we should exchange knowledge. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I talk a lot with them, with engineering, and uh, I think we can learn a lot and we can improve a lot our, our skills and the outcomes. That's what we want. For those of you who are only listening to this on a podcast platform, please try and reach out and get onto YouTube because on our YouTube channel, we've got some really cool clips where I interview the guests.